Part 1. Hype and Luxury Luxury equals death is our starting point. This equation is the way we got to heaven in the first place. In our research, hype and luxury are intimately related. We'll get to that in a minute. Both of them are about desire, what you want and what you get. For now, this is what you need to know. Total freedom from desire is to be slash feel like you're already dead. True luxury is the absence of all desire, aka death. In addition to this, true security is the elimination of all risk, which is only possible if you're already dead. Heaven is the most secure place in the world. Hype cycle theory. To get to heaven, we have to die. To die, we have to begin with hype. We have to get all hyped up and think about what it means. As we explore hype cycle theory, death is where we start and death is where we end. What is hype and how does it operate? Hype is the engine of hyperstition, a topic to discuss another day. Hype works as a kind of shepherd's tone, the audio illusion of a forever ascending tone, an upward momentum traveling across culture, trying to outrun its own obsolescence. Hype is a promise of a future that doesn't need to arrive. It only requires a transient belief in it, since you're about to be swallowed up by the next wave any minute anyway. Hype is seductive because its incessant cycle keeps you occupied, away from the ultimate meaning monster at the end of the game, aka the void slash death. Luxury and inequality. What's the connection between hype and luxury, you may be wondering. Extreme socioeconomic inequality is a psychosocial wound. Both hype and luxury are ways of handling this wound. Hype versus luxury, manic versus depressive, flipping versus keeping, Adderall versus Xanax. Luxury is about class anxiety, creating it or soothing it. Luxury is coded relative to an increasingly artificial idea of the middle. What do we mean by this? There's a contradiction at play. The real middle class is shrinking, real quote unquote. However, the aesthetic middle class, or the category of that, continues to expand. Let's say it again. In the West, the middle classes are rapidly shrinking. Many in the new rising middle classes in so-called developing and frontier countries have living standards significantly below that of their Western counterparts. Meanwhile, the image of the middle class, the infinite kitchen island of doom, the biggest heat tech puffer in the world, keeps expanding to include even the most extreme wealth. Where is luxury in the infinite middle? Even in a situation where the wealthy don't choose a fur coat, luxury still exists. It just exists in different ways. What ways are those? Luxury equals expensive. Luxury is expensive no matter what. Expensive isn't just money. Something can be cognitively expensive, emotionally expensive, time-consuming, socially costly, etc. Zen enlightenment is expensive. Luxury is predicated on scarcity. A scarcity of wealth, a scarcity of time. Luxury equals freedom from desire. That famous dead guy who wore a black turtleneck every day wore it because that turtleneck offered him a profound freedom from choice. People are obsessed with decision fatigue and other annoying cognitive problems. Freedom from desire, escaping the perpetual motion of the hype cycle, would be the ultimate luxury. This can only happen under post-scarcity. Luxury equals death. Let's say it again. Total freedom from desire is to be slash feel like you're already dead. 
True luxury is the absence of all desire. True security is the elimination of risk. Part two, describing heaven. We're dead, we're in the afterlife. We're in heaven, what do we see? Heaven is beige, cosmic beige, seamless and flush, frictionless. Everything is the right scale, but 10% bigger. Heaven is indirect lighting. Heaven is translucent glass. Heaven is Jim Jilbang. Heaven is interior. Heaven is the opposite of retail. Heaven is the invisible, perpetual availability of and access to service and services. Heaven is wellness. Heaven is goop. Heaven is by default, not new age. Heaven is spherical. Heaven is a totality slash totalitarian space, no outside. Heaven is 25% California, 25% Four Seasons, 25% Singapore, 25% welfare state space. One day, if I go to heaven, I'll look around and say, you know, it ain't bad, but it ain't San Francisco. Heaven is omnipresent quality. Quality is predictability. Predictability is zero wasted effort in considering alternatives. The aesthetics of excellence. It's rich kids of Instagram space. It's hype William space. It's the other world of K-pop videos. Idols never step outside. They traverse the metropolis inside hermetically sealed bubbles of luxury vehicles. Like Cosmopolis, Melania Trump's whole Instagram takes place in the interior of a dark, low vehicle. Heaven smells like a new car. Heaven is a foam. It's an elongated, twisted, truncated, tessellated bubble. Heaven is a place on Earth. Heaven is a wormhole of privilege through the world. Quote, unquote, wormhole. Heaven is travertine. Heaven is quality measured in quantities. Heaven is a long dinner in a non-place among historical figures, celebrities, and the wealthy. I can't stand light. I hate weather. My idea of heaven is moving from one smoke-filled room to another. Part three, accounting for heaven. So what's the deal? We're not talking about the Judeo-Christian heaven. We're talking about a set of implicit assumptions about luxury, comfort, and predictability. It's the destination of a journey. Heaven is a place where nothing ever happens. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It is life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Wasted effort is entropy. Entropy in heaven is countered with a constant growing energy input. It's maximum energy potential with minimum effort slash output. Heaven is 100% design. To design is to define. To define is to predict. Predictability is quality. Heaven is 100% quality. Heaven is a gift, a potlatch, a burning of surplus. Heaven is a plateau. Heaven must plateau. It can't oscillate, can't grow, can't collapse. There's no singularity in heaven. Is heaven normative? Heaven is insinuated or suggested by normativity, but actually disrupted by it. Actually enforcing norms is usually violent, which leads you to hell, not heaven. <laughs> it's a self-defeating proposition. 
My idea of heaven consists of all the things I would go to hell for. My idea of heaven is a great big baked potato and someone to share it with. Heaven is freedom from choice. Heaven simply cannot be described. Heaven is total satisfaction, 0% chaos, which is suffocation if you are alive, bliss if you aren't. Is there air in heaven? That's a good question. Heaven is a place where nothing ever happens and nobody works and everyone is comfortable and nobody has a body that has needs and total satisfaction. Heaven is the point or boring logical conclusion of wealth, which is also why it's not real.
The trout. On this most sensual land, I bounced down the green tide, throat full of pollen. Immediately upon arriving at the river, I scurry at its rugged edge, searching for caterpillars on the undersides of the willow leaves. Worms, bugs, and creepy crawlies go about their business as I play a game of thinking myself into the minds and skins of other things. Heat from a vengeful sun pounds down. I can't think myself her. I tried. There is a sudden disturbance to this piece. As trickle turns to splash, and I freeze. Can I think myself into a splash? Something moves beneath the surface of the water. It teases that tranquility. Standing perfectly quiet and still, I see it, a trout. Stillness was my most appropriate tool because I managed to take the whole thing in. I saw the trout itself, a head, a flash of silver, and then nothing but ripples in the water, and then a return to serenity. I slam my body down and wriggle on my belly to the bank and glide my hand in down to the elbow. A little closer now, teetering on the edge as my breast almost touches the surface of the water. Halfway up to my shoulder now. I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven trouts as I caress the water with my little fingers. I could see my intervention in this force as the water circled my arm to create a new pathway around me. Half a minute went by like half an hour. A little one draws near. I hold my breath. She parks herself in my little hand basket and I work slowly massaging from beneath the body of the trout. We touch. My fingers close around the body. I hold the trout. 
and in its holding, I felt a unification. I could not tell where I began, and it ended. I pull myself further forward to gaze into her eyes, undulating my fingers, seeing her in a trance. I sigh as we mutually tickle each other. Look at us both, here, like this, orchestrations of carbon. But there is a betrayal in this moment, and I wrench deer trout from its habitat and sink my teeth deep into its flesh. I instantly taste and relish the trials of its wild existence. My mouth a symphony of flavor, if only I could sing how she tastes. Bones sink themselves between my teeth as my jaw clamps deeper to take its flesh chunk. Trout's tail and head slaps my cheeks pink and with two hands I yank her off of me. I chew, pause, and comprehend the fleshy hole before my eyes as I gain a temporal lucidity. O oh, trout, paragon of animals, what have I done? You don't bleed. It flaps so violently in my hand, I drop it on the ground. Should I return it? Should I eat its head? Finish it? I could not pick up deer trout. I ran. I ran in all directions. My tongue in constant motion, I tried to take every form and shape so as to not be the murderer. Tried to be a caterpillar, tried to be a bucket, a cat, a horse, a table, a stone. I even tried to be a rose. I wanted to turn back, to undo what I had done to live life over before the crime. It looks easy to go backwards, but it meant taking more chunks from deer trout. It was impossible. I knew then that I had broken another thread that holds me to the world. I collapse in mournful ecstasy.
The ships skim across the surface of the city landscape. Claxons blare, alarm sound. She gathers up her decoy double in her arms. She looks up at her. She gets up and looks around at the devastation. There are tears in her eyes. She turns, they walk away. Traffic clogs the smoggy sky. There is a stir of surprise. The door to the apartment slides open. They look at each other for a long moment. He's done it again. He bites his lip in frustration and shame. There is a long silence as they walk away. Only footsteps are heard. His power is off. He's in a meditative state. It is quiet. We hear distant footsteps in the corridor outside the apartment. His eyes dart around the room. She pulls her nightdress around her shoulders. He becomes a little shy. She shakes her head. There is a brief silence. They look into each other's eyes for the first time. The two laugh. From high above, light streams down from the lofty ceilings. He is very restless. He is sweating. He wakes up with a start, then realises where he is. She hands him a bowl of mush and bread. There is an awkward moment. They exit onto the main plaza. The great courtyard stretches out before them and they see the rose-coloured dome of the palace on the far side. They pick up their gear and start to cross the courtyard. Something is going on here. They all exit down the main staircase. The main entrance at the base of the huge temple is bustling with activity. People are passing through the little street. Old men are sunning themselves. Women are gossiping. Kids are playing. She stops, beaming. Everyone sits and starts passing food. They nod. She is holding one in her arms. They are all smiling hugely. She is wearing official robes and standing between two robe legislators. Her expression is severe. She continues packing. There is a brief pause. Then a child puts its hand up. He touches her arm. They look into each other's eyes. He touches her chin. She doesn't resist. She comes to her senses and pulls away. He looks at her. Silence. The setting sun touches the mountain peaks. The lake glows in the rose-tinted light. Floating lamps gleam softly like jewels at the lodge. The dessert is some kind of fruit. His eyes are on his plate. She makes room for him. Brief pause. Silence. The logs flame in the hearth. There is silence as they stare at the fire. Silence for a moment. A door slides open. A shaft of brilliant light pierces the swirling rain. The brilliant white light. He has large almond-shaped eyes. The door slides open. The room is bathed in brilliant white light. The whole place is ultra high tech. Beyond is the shimmering expanse of the lake. Several other lakes stretch to the horizon. The warm air is full of little floating puffballs. They sit on the grass in a playful, coy mood, talking. A mischievous little grin creeps across his face. He looks back at her, straight-faced, and can't hold a smile. They both laugh. She turns him over. He is pulling a stupid face at her. She yelps in mock fury and takes a swing at him. He catches her arm. She struggles. They roll over in the grass. Suddenly, they become aware of the contact between them. They let go of each other quickly and sit up, looking away. He pulls her up, and now they're easy together. Not self-conscious anymore. She puts her arms around his waist and leans against his back. Below is a huge parade ground. The rain and wind are brutal. They are seated at tables, eating. The door slides closed behind him. The signal is very weak. The image fades in and out. The silent lodge. He mutters to himself. Sweat forms on his forehead. 
He turns violently, he cries out. She sees he is meditating and turns to go. Brief pause. Rain lashes the city. Below, mighty waves pound the stilts, breaking almost to the height of the platforms. He is identical to the boys in the classroom. He wears a jumpsuit. He is unshaven and mean looking, his face pitted with scars of old wounds. There are a couple of weird tattoos on his muscular forearms. He moves in front of him, blocking the view. The door slides closed. He is deep in thought. The waves crash against the water city as the storm continues. Light suddenly it streams from the base of a landing platform as a door slides open. The door closes behind him. He pulls his robe around him and stands braced against the gale. Below, a huge wave crashes against the stilts. It slides open. Ahead, the corridor is deserted. He moves down it. The bedroom door is wide open. Clear signs of a hurried departure. He grapples desperately for a handhold on the slick surface. It disappears. Lightning flashes. Rain lashes the tower and streams across the surface of the platform to where a hand suddenly clutches at the very edge of the platform. A moment later, another hand grabs hold. They look down from the edge of the bluff to where the homestead is seen on the desert floor below. One of his legs is heavily bandaged, the other is missing. He balances awkwardly and puts out a hand. Silence. There seems no way he can avoid it. He rides up and stops the bike in front of a campfire. He stops and looks down at some tracks. Somewhere, close by, a night animal howls. She stops, listening to the animal howling nearby. She shivers slightly, then turns and goes into the garage at the side of the courtyard. Short silence. The wind whips at him. He looks around. The night is quiet except for the occasional weird cry. His foot slips on the edge, sending a stream of pebbles skittering into the darkness. Silence. He gets off the bike and creeps to the edge. They are sitting a short distance from the door. He pulls himself to his feet. There are candles everywhere. A shaft of moonlight from a hole in the roof pierces the gloom of the hut. He cuts her free, takes her into his arms and lowers her gently to the ground. Her eyes are closed, her face is bloodied. She's been terribly beaten. They are caked with blood. There is silence for a moment. Far below, a flat plain stretches into the distance. He stops, peering into the darkness where strange shapes loom indistinctly. He sees a cluster of great towers like fantastic stalagmites rise from the plain below. The pale light grows. Thin tendrils of smoke rise slowly in the cold, clean air. Somewhere, a dog barks. An old woman comes out of one of the huts. She carries a pail. She swirls it and tosses the dirty water onto the ground. His face is a grim mask. A line of reflecting pools with splashing fountains flanked by statues on each side leads to the main entrance to the awesome building. He is multicoloured in several textures, but he is complete. He forgets formality and hugs her. He grabs her arm. They stop looking around in wonder at the emptiness. They start forward. As they pass, the surface of the pillars seems to pulse slowly and move. He bows courteously. They are escorted out of the chamber to the sounds of chuckling. 
by straining harder as just possible for their lips to meet. They kiss. They kiss again. It goes dark. Suddenly there is a harsh beeping sound. Silence. He slumps to the foot of the wall, semi-conscious. He stumbles back against the wall, trips and falls. It is no contest. Suddenly the great doors slide open. Silence. He salutes formally. His energy drains. His strokes become feebler, slower. He flies forward. The beautiful temple basks in the red glow of the setting sun. They are standing, looking out through the tall windows of the great plaza below.